I had to move my own pulpit here tonight. On there? All right. Let me bring this thing to life. I'm not sure why I use a password on there. There's nothing in there worth any stealing, I guess. All right. Well, tonight I'm going to get right to it without any fanfare because I want to leave time for a prayer at the end. And I'm going to take a, a bit of a prophetic approach to my message tonight. Not that I'm a prophet, but um, I'm, I'm going to be bold. Uh, I'm going to be direct. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to mince uh, any words. And uh, I'm not going to try to fly out the cuff here and impress anybody. I'm going to stay kind of constrained here. I'm not going to go all over the place like I've been known to do at times. And I'm going to try to just stick with what God has given me over the past couple of days. Um, it's not going to tickle any ears. It's not going to tweak any funny bones. But this is a Sunday night crowd between the holidays, and I believe uh, this is a group that's ready to go deeper with God and ready to take, take up maybe a, a bit of a tough challenge. And so that's what I'm going to lay on you tonight. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles 7.14. Some of you just uh, from that passage kind of know uh, a bit about where we're going. We're going to get there in just a moment. Before we do, I want to encourage you uh, tonight not to let the enemy of your soul fool you into thinking that you're in for a life that's constricting or constraining or overbearing in any way if you take up the challenge I'm going to put before you tonight. Because I can assure you that there is no more liberating lifestyle than to go after God with everything uh, that's in you. And that's the challenge I'm going to put before you tonight. Nothing will bring you more satisfaction, more fulfillment, more purpose, more peace than to pursue God's heart with all your heart. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to bring your word tonight. I pray that, uh, that they would not just um, hear my words, but they would hear your heart. God, have your way in this place. Lord, stir us to something beyond the, anything that we could do in and of ourselves. So we know it's your spirit. Bring us to a point of brokenness. Bring us to a point of preparedness for everything that you have in store for us in the days ahead. We'll give you glory for it all, for you're worthy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let me start by simply asking this. What's the mission of this church? What's the stated mission of this church? To go to heaven and take as many there with us as we're going to. Now, uh, how do we do that? How do we show people the way to heaven? Think about this for a second. Uh, uh, how do we really, uh, in order to lead people or show people the way uh, to anywhere, what do we need to know ourselves? We need to know how to get there ourselves. Remember when Jesus was about ready to leave the earth and he was uh, telling his disciples, they were kind of confused all what was going on, and he, and he tried to put their mind at ease and assure them that they knew the way to where he was going. And they said, well, how do we know the way? How did he respond to that? He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. You see, they knew where he was going and how to get there because they knew him personally. They knew how to find it because they knew who was going before them. So if you know Jesus, you know the way to heaven. But how do we help others find and follow that way for themselves? Can we describe it to them? Can we give them uh, directions? Maybe. But how many people in our culture are taking the initiative to, to ask or to, to inquire of that for themselves? Because you see, the best way for people, uh, for us to help people know the way is for us to show them the way. So how do we do that? Here's the thing. Most churches uh, put the bulk of their efforts into ministries and services and programs uh, that are aimed at drawing people into the facility to come and see what's going on at church. And what goes on here should draw people's attention to Christ. But to help people see Jesus, it's not a matter of getting, getting them to come here. We need to take the message and the ministry to them. Our main focus should not be uh, on getting people uh, to come here. Our main focus on sh should be on getting us to go. That's the Great Commission. But the more I've thought about it, it goes beyond that. Because the best way to get people to see Christ is not for them to come to us, and it's not even just for us to go to them. That's important, but the best way to show people how to get anywhere, including to Christ, is for them to see us going there ourselves. To see us going after Him with more passion and purpose than we go after anything else. 
Psalm chapter 42, verses 1 through 3, talks about that when it says, As the deer pants for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, for the living God. When can I come and stand before him, or when can I come and meet with him? Day and night I have only tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? You know, that's essentially the question that people in our culture are asking. Maybe not literally, but that's the attitude they have. Where is this God of yours? What's the evidence that he's even real? And if he is, what's he up to? And for all the focus that we put on great ministries and programs and worship and facilities, people outside of here are still left wondering, where is this God of yours? And I can't help but thinking that people wouldn't have to be left wondering if they saw more of him in us. And if they saw more of us really going after him. Psalm chapter 63, verses 1 through 3. David wrote this while he was wandering in the wilderness. He said, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Does that describe our land today? Dry and weary Over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about the need for spiritual awakening in our lives, in this church, and in our land. But that process of renewal or revival or whatever you want to call it is not some quick fix in terms of preparing our hearts for a a, a culture-shaking move of God. But there is a definite starting point for all of it, and it has everything to do with us and those of us right here going after God. So let's look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. That's the first point I want to make. It's simply this. Our land needs healing. Regardless of your perception or definition or revival, whether you see the need for refreshing in your own life, is there any doubt that our land needs healing? Just look at the division, the the defiance, the propensity toward materialism and sensuality and self-reliance. Has there ever been a time when a land was in greater need of healing? There's been time in history when the need may have seemed more apparent, when nations are ravaged by war or disaster or poverty or political divides. And there have been civilizations for sure who have have, uh, uh, had practices of all kinds of brutality, maybe greater than anything that we think we see. But has any nation ever had the kind of influence we have? And I look at the ungodly behaviors described in the Bible, and I think that our land is on a more dire path than any of them. You just look at some of the the horrendous evils condemned over and over by the prophets. Things like idolatry and brutality and sexual immorality and, and, and pagan practice and sacrifices and on and on. We may not have idols of wood and stone on every corner, but we put as many things in front of God and in place of God as any nation in history including unprecedented levels of materialism and propensity toward pleasure seeking and obsession with entertainment. And every aspect of our media and advertising and entertainment and fashion is saturated with sensual perversion and and, and a twist and a distortion of God's plan for sexuality. You can't even get away from it. In fact, most people don't even try because most of our entertainment is is, is just full of a barrage of sensuality and violence. And while there may have been more brutal civilizations, has there ever been a nation that has literally legislated the destruction of of its most vulnerable to the degree that we have? For over four decades, our political landscape has been uh, dominated by a divide on the issue of what we can and can't do with the unborn. Even the tensions today along gender lines are often reduced to uh, the right to destroy life in the name of equal rights or health care or whatever. In the Old Testament, one of the most vile practices among pagan nations was human sacrifice. And child sacrifice in particular was at at the depth of moral depravity. And the fact that we don't do it as part of some pagan ritual doesn't nullify the fact that no nation, civilized or uncivilized, has ever taken more innocent life. And yet we do it under the guise of freedom and convenience and human rights of all things. But even this God can forgive if people would turn to him. But most people in our culture don't even see the need to turn from or be saved from anything. 
Even the most corrupt cultures in the Bible were closer to repentance than most of us. You look at the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, one of the most brutally corrupt nations in history. That was the place Jonah was trying to avoid because he would have rather seen God destroy it than have its vile citizens turn and receive mercy. And yet when they heard the message, they repented, they turned. Or you look at the city of Sodom, whose name still implies moral depravity. Jesus said if the miracles and and acts of power he demonstrated while on earth were done in Sodom, they would have repented long ago. Unlike some of the places where, where he ministered. And yet what nation has ever had more gospel witness, more resource, more opportunity than we have? And yet people are more hell-bent than ever on going their own way. And we nurture that attitude from childhood and the media markets it in such an innocuous way. Be true to yourself. Be who you are. Don't let anyone tell you what you can or can't be. It's, it sounds so positive, so uplifting. But it's been building toward a very sinister notion, one that's been fully developed today in a culture that allows everyone to define who and what they are, even down to the very core of their physiology. I think of the song that we, we sing to God, I am who you say I am, expressing confidence in all God says about us, about, as us as his children. But the anthem of our culture today is I am who I say I am. And no one, including God, can put me in a box and tell me who or what I am. It's the epitome of arrogance. And I ask you, has there ever been a time when a people or a nation was more certain that they were going in the right direction when in fact they were going faster than ever in the wrong direction? How can God even forgive people when they don't even see a need to repent? And I'm not just talking about people being open or closed to religion. A lot of people are okay with the notion of God and the good vibes they get from going to church and, 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 and worshiping or whatever. I'm talking about the need to do a complete 180 in their lifestyle and their worldview. But then again, who needs to do that? We could just add God to your current lifestyle. We'll be fine. No need to change. No need to get too radical. Yeah, our nation is in dire need of healing. And if it doesn't come, our grandkids are going to grow up in a world that won't even allow them to see the light. And I hate to paint such a grim picture, but that's where we're headed unless something changes. But it can change. But it has to start right here with us. Because that's the second thing I want you to know tonight. Our nation needs revival. Our land needs healing. But it starts with us. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 said, If my people who are called by my name, it doesn't matter whether we participated in the culture of sin. For the most part, we have to some degree. Again, just look at the things that entertain us. We may not commit the acts, but we participate. We indulge. We tolerate. As much as anything, we simply conform. So yeah, we need to repent too. We need to uh, to turn away from. We need to, to turn off some things. But even if we've maintained our faith, even if we've stood for righteousness, we still need to take responsibility for the condition of our land. Because if we're going to truly show the world who Jesus is, then we need to follow his example. And what did he do for us? He took the sin of the world for all humanity, for all time, upon himself when he made a way for us to be reconciled to God. And now the Bible tells us that we've been given that ministry of reconciliation. And that means more than just introducing people to Jesus or just uh, showing them what he's like. That's a big part of it, but it's not all of it. Because we're the ones who've got to stand in for those who don't even realize they're lost. God has always looked to his people to step up and intercede for those who still needed reconciliation and restoration and renewal and revival. Ezekiel chapter twenty two thirty. God says, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall, who would stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I wouldn't have to destroy it. But you know what? He didn't find anybody. And so I ask you today, will he find anybody here? Because throughout Scripture, God has always looked for people, and godly people have always taken upon themselves the responsibility for society's lack of spiritual focus and integrity. I look at people like Moses, who is called a friend of God. He interceded for people who were constantly complaining at him and God, and yet Moses would have given up his place in God's purpose just to spare that stubborn nation. 
Or you look at Daniel, one of the most righteous men who ever lived in the midst of an ungodly culture. He prayed without compromise for the deliverance of a people who were the very reason he had been taken into captivity since his youth. And Nehemiah took it upon himself to return to a country and rebuild a nation that had collapsed as a result of its ungodliness. And all of these cried out to God on behalf of others and took responsibility for the sins of a nation. And they said, Lord, we have abandoned you. We have rebelled. We have rejected your covenant. We have sinned. And then there's people like the prophet Jeremiah called the weeping prophet who spent his life interceding for a nation completely oblivious to its need for God. It never did turn. Because even though we've seen throughout Scripture and throughout history the influence that even one godly person can have in transporting a society, that usually isn't the way it happens. It's all too easy to leave the heavy lifting to the professionals, to the church leaders, to ministers, the people whose job it is to go after God and to pray for people. But the Scripture doesn't say if my pastors will pray. It doesn't say if my preacher or my prophets will pray. It says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. It involves all of us. It's all of our responsibility to take up that challenge. That doesn't mean that individuals can't make a difference. I can tell you story after story of prayer warriors in in churches uh, that, that were constantly doing battle behind the scenes for loved ones or for their congregations. And a lot of the times it didn't even become so apparent the influence they have until they were gone. I remember people like, like uh, John Lovelace's uh, mom, uh, Barb, who was known as one of the prayer warriors in, in, in a church where I pastored. And I remember when she passed away, there was an unmistakable void in that spiritual realm that became very evident in the life of the church. And we had to step up and take up that mantle and get diligent in prayer just to fill that void. Because your prayers and mine do make a difference. But it takes persistence. And there's a spiritual battle raging all around us. And and for all the outward evidence of our nation's godlessness, the primary battle is going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. And that battle has to be waged in a spiritual way and with spiritual weapons. And that's why 2 Chronicles tells us, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. It starts with us. It starts with us doing what? What what does it mean to seek God? Is he hiding? Is he making himself difficult to find? Certainly not. But what he wants is for those of us who already identify with him to to not sit on our laurels, not to sit on our backside, but to get up and and, and pursue a deeper relationship with him, to keep going further, not to be uh, content to keep going this far and then falling back and never be getting beyond a certain point in our relationship with him. In other words, he wants us to go after him, to pursue his purposes with everything that's in us, so much that becomes obvious to everyone around that something is going on, that we're headed somewhere with purpose, with passion, towards something that just maybe they need in their own lives. Because the world needs to see us going after God with a passion. That's the third point I want to make tonight. Our nation needs healing. It needs to start with us. And the world needs to see us going after God. Doesn't matter where you're coming from or if you feel close to God or far away from Him right now because even if you feel far from Him, even if you failed Him, even if you've walked away from Him, away from that deep relationship, God says to His people in Deuteronomy chapter 4, 29, but even from there, from that distant place, if you will seek the Lord your God, you will find Him if you search for Him with all your heart and with all your soul. You're never too far from God to be at the front of the pack of pursuing Him. I don't know if you recall the images of 9-11. When people were standing around and gazing up at the burning towers. Until they begin to crumble. And then what happened? They turned and they ran for safety. Or maybe you recall seeing the images from the uh, tsunami in in Indonesia when when the wave was approaching the shore and people were running for their lives. And I don't mean any disrespect to those tragic situations, but the point I'm making tonight is more serious than any of those disasters. Because when people see others running in mass in a certain direction, they know that something is up. They know that there's either a disaster to flee or something awesome to see, but something significant is happening. 
So whether it's running hard and fast away from danger or running even harder toward a purpose, that's the only way people are going to take notice. And that's the only way that people are going to uh, be influenced to change the direction they're headed. The fact is that most people are followers. They just go with the flow. And in our culture, the overwhelming flow is away from God. The sad thing is, is a lot of Christians are getting caught up in that tide. Even in the name of staying relevant to everything, when in fact all they're doing is drifting along with the crowd. They're getting further from God themselves. And even if we aren't going the way of the world, a lot of times it's, it's we're just standing in the crowd, looking around and taking in what's going on. And maybe we're troubled by it, but what are we doing about it? If we stay in neutral, we're going to get swept up in the tide and we're going to have absolutely no influence because we will never draw people's attention to God by going in the same misguided direction they are. Even if we're going in God's direction, just strolling along at a casual pace, we're not going to get anybody's attention. And even fewer are going to follow us. You see, we're never going to change the culture simply by becoming part of it. More than anything else, that's what the Old Testament prophets condemned over and over in God's people. Their recurrent tendency to adopt the ways and customs of all the nations around them. That's called conforming. And God's people are called to be transforming. But the only things that are going to make our lives and passion for God stand out, the only way that we stand a chance of turning people's attention to Jesus is if they see us running passionately and unswervingly in His direction. And that means we need to go after God with an intensity and a purpose like never before because that's the kind of tenacity it's going to take to, return, to turn rebellion into revival. You remember David? David was called the man after God's own heart. You know how he ran toward the battle with Goliath? That wasn't a fluke because David was always running in God's direction. He was known for, he wrote about running in the paths of God's command. So much he wanted to go after the purpose that God had for him, regardless of his shortcomings and no matter what anybody else around him was thinking or doing. Or I think of Jacob, a person like David who had a lot of character flaws. Even the name Jacob implied that he was a deceiver. But when he was fleeing from his brother and came to that place of encounter with God, he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And he would not give up. He would not let go until he had God's blessing. And he left that place with a limp. It stayed with him the rest of his life. And his character and journey, he had a long way to go. But because of that tenacity toward God, he got a new name. Israel. He became the father of a nation. And I could go on to describe people all throughout Scripture from Abel and Enoch and Abraham, Caleb, Hannah, Josiah, Hezekiah, Deborah, Elijah, and, and, and the women of the New Testament like Mary and, and, and the sister of Lazarus, Mary Magdalene, who hung on Jesus' every word and followed him all the way to the cross, even when his disciples deserted him. And faithful men and women throughout the history of the church who went after God like no one else in their generation to the point where many gave their lives just to make sure the light of the gospel could shine in the darkest corners of the world. These weren't passive people. These were people who ran hard after God. And they weren't just running from danger. They were running toward a purpose. And in the process, they transformed societies and cultures and countries and nations. Our nation, our culture is running fast and hard away from God. And the only thing that's going to turn their attention back in God's direction is when they see His people running even harder and faster toward Him. And the only thing that should ever turn us back toward the fallout is not to dabble in the danger ourselves, not just to look on the destruction, but be, to be like those first responders in 9-11 who are rushing back into the fray to rescue people from the flames. That's why we're still here. We're on a search and rescue mission. And never are we more like Jesus than when we're working to rescue those who are lost and dying. But we can't save anyone ourselves. All we can do is show them the way to Jesus. So while others may be trying to draw people's attention to God through dynamic services or vibrant worship or extraordinary programs and events, I hope that we as a church can see that the most effective way to get people looking and perhaps moving toward God is for us to go after Him with more passion and purpose than anyone else is going after anything else. So I ask you tonight, is there anything...
that we're more passionate about? Do we have a higher purpose than God's? Are we distracted by all the, the enticements of the world? Is our focus more on, on, on our problems and, and, and our priorities than it is on God's purpose? Or are we ready to be emptied of ourselves so we can be filled with the power and presence of God? Because I can tell you with certainty, God's passion and priority is to pursue the lost. In fact, even now, the Bible tells us this very moment, Christ himself is interceding to the Father on our behalf. Are we willing and ready to do the same for a lost world? For a culture that's collapsing all around us? Are we ready to go after God like never before? Taking responsibility for the failures and the faithlessness of a nation and standing in the gap for a world that's headed for destruction. Because the Bible says if God's people who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven and he will forgive our sins and he will heal our land. Pastor Brad, if you would come and just begin to play. Our land needs revival. It's our only hope as a nation, but it has to start with us. With us going after God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all of our strength. And the evidence of that is how willing we're going to be to put everything else aside and go after God in prayer. Because passionate and intensive and extensive prayer has always been what preceded revival. And it's the only thing that's going to change the course of lives and societies and nations. But just like an Olympic sprinter, before the race begins, before the signal sounds or they burst from the blocks, they take their mark and they begin the race on their knees. And that has to be how it starts with us. The pursuit of God, the one running for the prize toward heaven. If we're going to fulfill our stated mission to take as many people as we can with us, then that pursuit has to start on our knees. The Bible says that we need to seek the Lord while He can be found. Because the day is fast approaching when the opportunity to find him, when the opportunity to receive his gift of eternal life is going to be over. And before that time comes, we need to be on our knees. We need to go after God like never before because that's the only thing that's going to get the world's attention. Doesn't mean they see us doing it, doesn't mean we do anything we do for God for show. And I'm telling you, if we're going after God harder and faster with more intensity and passion than we ever have before, somebody's going to notice it. There's going to be a difference in our life. And we're not going to leave the world wondering, where is this God of yours? Because he's going to be evident in the lives of those who know him. I want you to stand all over this place right now. I'm not going to beg you to come. I'm not going to give an extensive altar call. But if you realize the need tonight that we just need to go after God like we never have before, because that's the way revival is going to happen, and it's not going to be a quick fix. It's going to be something that we persist in. It's going to be something that we go after. And we're not seeking some experience. We're not seeking some event. We're not just seeking to see great and powerful things. We're seeking God himself. Because here's the thing. We talk about revival so many times in terms of us getting more of God. That's not what revival's about. Revival's about God getting more of you. Now I'm going to tell you, when God gets more of you, you're going to have all you want of Him because He wants to use you in a greater way than you can ever imagine. And so tonight, I want us just to begin to come all over this place. If you want to find a place that you can, but there's something about stepping out, something about taking that posture of, of just going for it and saying, God, we need more of you.
and I want to give you more of me. If you're tonight, I just want to challenge you. These altars are open. Let's pursue God. Let's go after him. And let's see in the days ahead what just what God might do through those who will pursue him with passion.